but the power and influence of the Freud family in America was about to grow even more. Politicians were about to turn to Anna Freud's cousin, Edward Bernays, for help in a time of crisis. He was going to manipulate the inner feelings and fears of the masses to help America's politicians fight the Cold War. I don't mean to say, and no one can say to you, that there are no dangers. Of course there are risks if we are not vigilant. But we do not have to be hysterical. In 1953, the Soviet Union exploded its first hydrogen bomb, and the fear of nuclear war and communism gripped the United States. Those in power became concerned about how to reassure the population. Committees were set up and public information films made, appealing for calm in the face of new threats, like nuclear fallout. It's the fallacy of devoting 85% of one's worrying capacity to an agent that constitutes only about 15% of an atomic bomb's destroying potential. At this point, Edward Bernays was living in New York. In the 1920s, he had invented the profession of public relations and was now one of the most powerful PR men in America. He worked for most of the major corporations and advised politicians, including President Eisenhower. Like his uncle Sigmund, Bernays was convinced that human beings were driven by irrational forces. The only way to deal with the public was to connect with their unconscious desires and fears. Bernays argued that instead of trying to reduce people's fear of communism, one should actually encourage and manipulate the fear, but in such a way as it became a weapon in the Cold War. Rational argument was fruitless. What my father understood about groups is that they are manipulable, they're malleable, and that, that you can tap into their deepest desires or their deepest fears and use that to your own purposes. I don't think he felt that all those publics out there had reliable judgment, that they very easily might vote for the wrong man or want the wrong thing, so that they had to be guided from above. One of Bernays' main clients was the giant United Fruit Company. They owned vast banana plantations in Guatemala in Central America. For decades, United Fruit had controlled the country through pliable dictators. It was known as a banana republic. But in 1950, a young officer, Colonel Arbenz, was elected president. He promised to remove United Fruit's control over the country. And in 1953, he announced the government would take over much of their land. It was a massively popular move, but a disaster for United Fruit. And they turned to Bernays to help get rid of Arbenz. United Fruit brings in Bernays, and he basically understood that what United Fruit Company had to do was change this from being a popularly elected government that was doing some things that were good for the people there into this being very close to the American shore, a threat to American democracy, that it being at a time in the Cold War when Americans responded to issues of the Red Scare and what communism might do, he was trying to transform this and brilliantly did transform it into an issue of a communist threat very close to our shores taking United Fruit again as a commercial client out of the picture and making it look like a question of American democracy, American values being threatened. In reality, Arbenz was a democratic socialist with no links to Moscow. But Bernays set out to turn him into a communist threat to America. He organized a trip to Guatemala for influential American journalists. Few of them knew anything about the country or its politics. Bernays arranged for them to be entertained and to meet selected Guatemalan politicians who told them that Arbenz was a communist controlled by Moscow. During the trip, there was also a violent anti-American demonstration in the capital. Many of those who worked for United Fruit were convinced it had been organized by Bernays himself. He also created a fake independent news agency in America called the Middle American Information Bureau. It bombarded the American media with press releases saying that Moscow was planning to use Guatemala as a beachhead to attack America. All of this had the desired effect. In Guatemala, 
Guatemala, the Jacob R. Benz regime became increasingly communistic after its inauguration in 1951. Communists in the Congress and high governmental positions controlled major committees, labor and farm groups, and propaganda facilities. They agitated and led in demonstrations against neighboring countries and the United States. What was profoundly new in terms of what Bernays did is he took this menace to our backyard in Guatemala. For the first time, we saw Reds a couple hundred miles from uh, New Orleans who Eddie Bernays had us believing were a true threat to us, that it was going to be a Soviet outpost in our backyard. But what Bernays was doing was not just trying to blacken the Arbenz regime. He was part of a secret plot. President Eisenhower had agreed that America should topple the Arbenz government, but secretly. The CIA were instructed to organize a coup. Working with the United Fruit Company, the CIA trained and armed a rebel army and found a new leader for the country called Colonel Armas. The CIA agent in charge was Howard Hunt, later one of the Watergate burglars. What we wanted to do was have a terror campaign. Uh, to terrify our bench particularly, and terrify his, his troops, much as the German Stuka bombers terrified the population of, of uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, and, uh, and Poland at the onset of World War II, and just rendered everybody paralyzed. As planes flown by CIA pilots dropped bombs on Guatemala City, Edward Bernays carried on his propaganda campaign in the American press. He was preparing the American population to see this as the liberation of Guatemala by freedom fighters for democracy. He totally understood that the coup would happen when the public and the press, when conditions in the public and the press allowed for a coup to happen and he created those conditions. He was totally savvy in terms of just what he was helping create there in terms of this overthrow. But ultimately he was reshaping reality, uh, reshaping public opinion in a way that's undemocratic and manipulative. On June the 27th, 1954, Colonel Arbenz fled the country and Armas arrived as the new leader. Within months, Vice President Nixon visited Guatemala. In an event staged by United Fruit's PR department, he was shown piles of Marxist literature that had been found, it was said, in the presidential palace. This is the first time in the history of the world that the communist government has been overthrown by the people. And for that, we congratulate you and the people of Guatemala for the support they have given. And we are sure that under your leadership, supported by the people whom I have met by the hundreds on my visit to Guatemala, that Guatemala is going to enter a new era in which there will be prosperity for the people together with liberty for the people. Thank you very much for allowing us to see this exhibit of communism in Guatemala. You're welcome. And for dinner, see what mother has for dessert, banana gingerbread shortcake. Just another of the many tempting ways in which this nutritious fruit can be prepared. So now that you've seen where bananas come from before they reach your table, our journey to banana land is ended. We hope you enjoyed the trip. We know you like bananas. Bernays had manipulated the American people, but he had done so because he, like many others at the time, believed that the interests of business and the interests of America were indivisible, especially when faced with the threat of communism. But Bernays was convinced that to explain this rationally to the American people was impossible, because they were not rational. Instead, one had to touch on their inner fears and manipulate them in the interests of a higher truth. He called it the engineering of consent. He was doing it for uh, the American way of life, and w to which he was devoted, uh, so this sincerely devoted, and yet he felt the people were really pretty stupid. And that's the paradox. If you don't leave it up to the people themselves, but force them to choose what you want them to choose, however subtly, uh, then it's not democracy anymore. It's something else. It's being told what to do. It's being, it's, it's, it's that old authoritarian.